Good morning and half a day. The Committee on General Government Operation Appropriation and Housing is now called to order. For the record, today is Tuesday, June 14, and it is now 9 o'clock. 9.01. Noted for this budget hearing, we're disseminated via email to all centers and all main media broadcasting outlets. First public notice was issued on June 3rd, then on June 8th, and then on June 9th, and today is June 13. Committee will now hear Bill 276-36 COR from the Committee on Rules by the request of the Magahaga Guam, the Governor of Guam, in accordance with the Organic Act of Guam, an act making appropriation for the operation of the Executive Branch of the Governor of Guam for fiscal year ending September 30th, 2023, and making other appropriations establishing miscellaneous and administrative provisions relative to the Department of Agriculture. Um, None of my colleagues have joined me. Hopefully, they'll be here shortly. Those testifying on Bill 276-36 COR relative to the Department of Agriculture are invited to the panel. We have the director and her ASO. I'll ask the uh, director to introduce her ASO as we move along. The rules of this budget hearing, written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide my legislative staff will be written testimony for photocopying. Testimony may be read, and lengthy testimony should be summarized to about five minutes, which you have this morning. All right, Chelsea? Uh, those testifying be allowed to present oral testimony. Once you're done, please remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony as may be desired by members of the committee. Question and testimony shall be confined to the, to the agenda, which is the budget of the Department of Agriculture. Personal inference as to the character or motive of any center or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of the general rule of conduct will result in removal from the budget hearing. Proper form decorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for these proceedings. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form decorum may be restricted from providing oral testimony or may be asked to leave. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. Other questions may be submitted to the committee for submission to the agency for response. Please state your name and title for the record. I ask the panel to please rise while the Sergeant Arms will swear you in for your testimony. Please raise your right hand. Under penalty of perjury, the all affirm that any and all information you provide today, whether it be verbally, electronically, and in writing, be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you. This is Mr. Chair, under oath. This is just Mossy. Thank, thank you, Sergeant Arms. I'll ask now the director to please uh, introduce her staff and begin her testimony for her budget. Thank you. Hafidei Manana Suzuz, good morning, uh, Senator St. Augustine. Um, with me today, I have Ms. Antonia Santos, our illustrious administrative services officer with incredible institutional knowledge and experience. Um, and my name for the record is Chelsea Munya Breck, director for the Guam Department of Agriculture. Um, if we may have the slides and I can run through them for you. Um, next slide, please. This is the organizational chart for the Department of Agriculture, from, of which I'm sure you're familiar. Um, we have our five sections, but I like to say that we have six, uh, including our law enforcement section, which operates somewhat um, independent of the division of DAR. Next slide, please. For our agriculture development services, we currently have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine employees, and I want to thank you um, and this legislative body for the support that you've given us because when we took office and when I took office in 2019, we started with four. Um, and through the growth of this section, uh, you'll see on the next page that we've increased the amount of federal funding that we've applied for and secured. Um, from last year, we have an increase of over 700,000 in grant funding um, to support our operations and projects that we have to benefit the island. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one example of this is the um, micro grant for food security program, which is one, two, three, fourth down on the list. Um, and actually it's the third and fourth down. Through these two grants that we've secured in two consecutive years, we've been able to provide uh, about 230,000, wait, I'm sorry, $250,000 to local farmers to support their food production and food security. Um, they're through small grant projects that are easily um, 
conceivable and then implementable for the farmers and gardeners and ranchers. Um, this year we also held a grant training workshop for them to help them better prepare themselves for writing the proposals for the grants. We also secured a $338,000 grant with the help of uh, BSP to create a, um, a farm to food uh, or farm to family food bank that What's not listed here is that we have a $300,000 proposal to purchase local foods from farmers to provide to the food bank. So we will be double supporting our community by purchasing the food from the farmers and then distributing them to families in need. Next slide. With our animal health section, we have a new territorial veterinarian. Um, we have hired two additional animal control officers. We have two um, pending positions to be filled with the recruitment in progress. Um, so we've seen a tremendous increase in our public outreach under the leadership of our new veterinarian. Um, the first picture on the slide uh, is an outreach event that we had, uh, one of our agency's new signature events for May Harvest. We included the animal health section and the territorial veterinarian brought in the help of GAIN and our animal control officers and they were the busiest section for that entire day. In about three and a half hours, they serviced about um, 40 people with uh, microchips and rabies vaccinations. Um, and then the next slide, or the next picture that I wanted you to see is that we actually, under her training, the animal control officers are issuing violations to people who are not following proper law when it comes to managing their pets. Um, and on the bottom slide, or bottom of the picture, you'll see an animal control officer setting a trap. We've become flexible with their hours. So now they come in on weekends and early in the mornings when it's an ideal time to trap uh, strays rather than being a typical eight to five. So we've set them with a flexible schedule, provided them with leadership that provides training for them, and we've seen substantial changes and growth in that section. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, if you look at the 2000, on the bottom of the page, 2021 and 2022, um, last year they, they provided a total of 815 entry permits. This year, at the beginning of June, they're already more than halfway there. So we've seen an increase in the amount of services provided, um, even with the intakes to gain. Last year, there were only 207 total. This year, we're already at 116. Um, and, it, and added to that is that the veterinarian has been assisting with con, uh, providing spays and neuters at gain, so they've already cleared close to 300. And now they're starting on a waiting list of community members who have pets that they would like to have spayed or neutered but are not necessarily in a place where they can do that at a private veterinarian. Um, on the right side is a budget breakdown for a grant proposal that we submitted to the Department of Interior Technical Assistance Program to further fund a community spay neuter program. Next slide, please. With our biosecurity section, we've been able to um, replace our retired entomologist with an acting entomologist, Mr. Christopher Rosario. We have picked up a new commodity inspector and have another um, recruitment in progress with the Department of uh, Administration. Um, let's see, next slide, please. The biosecurity section has also increased their number of, or the amounts of federally funded projects by about a million dollars under the leadership of the new entomologist because typically prior to that, the only applicant for uh, federal funding was Dr. Dula, the invasive species coordinator. But the new entomologist is just as um, motivated and excited to serve his community, so they've applied for more funding to secure more projects. And if you like, we can discuss the different projects that they've applied for. I have a list here, but it's quite extensive. Everything ranging from outreach to uh, for not packing a pest, to the little fire ants, to a new potential issue with um, hornets that are coming from uh, outer areas. Um, 
and services provided in 2022 include 72 calls to the pest hotline. So this is only up to, um, I believe it was May. Um, they've issued over 4,000 permits, ranging from uh, plant products to eggs, uh, primarily plant products, and conducted over 489 inspections. And that's just this year alone. So we're really excited for the leadership that we have at biosecurity and the motivated personnel who are excited to do their job and help the community. Next slide, please. Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources. This first slide focuses on the technical guidance section um, and the administrative section, which share their funding both locally and federally. Most DAR staff, about, I think, 51 are 100% federally funded. But right now we have seven that are that share local and federal funding. Um, they oversee administrative support and permits and conduct federal consistency reviews and environmental consultations. Next slide, please. This is the breakdown of federal versus local funding for these staff. So on the top is all of the general fund that covers for the 40%, 20%, and 10% for the staff. Um, the program coordinator three is the only one at 10% uh, for local funds. Um, and on the bottom is the 60, 80, and 90% respectively, cumulatively applied for fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, and then on the same page, what you'll see is a comparison between 2021 and 2022 for services provided. Um, again, we're already close to exceeding and we will be surely doubling the number of services or customers who are serviced through this section. Um, again, with the support of this legislature, we've been able to increase the number of personnel in that section by hiring um, administrative assistants and administrative aid clerk typists. And right now we're in the process of recruiting two biologists to support the technical guidance section because we have one biologist and the program coordinator three right now who are conducting the 237 construction permit reviews, 74 clearing grading permit reviews, 16 ARC permit reviews. Um, and it's just, it can be overwhelming for them with two personnel trying to accomplish all of that. So we're trying to beef up that section to strengthen our capacity and their capacity to ensure thorough reviews to protect our island's resources. Next slide, please. And these cover, this slide covers our other federally funded positions, 51 totaling close to $3 million. 34 of the positions are filled with 17 vacancies, five current recruitments in progress. Um, the vacancies are not just reflective, it's not reflective of just the lack of hiring, but rather personnel that we've also lost to other agencies, um, typically our federal, um, the federales. And that their DAR is also in the process of reconciling the number of positions that they need with their federal grantor um, and consolidating those positions. Uh, right now, DAR has over 78 federal grants that they manage, totaling close to 16 or a little bit more than $16 million. And we currently have three new awards included in that amount, which um, we're really excited about. Uh, $435,000 in a partnership with the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology to study and try to address shark depredation on island, which has been plaguing our local fishers. If you know a fisherman at all who goes out there, they'll absolutely have a story to tell you about the sharks coming and stealing their catch. Um, and then another $500,000 in a competitive state and wildlife grant that we were just notified that um, we were awarded last week. And this is to um, begin raising a, a bumphead parrotfish, a tuhung, and releasing it into our reefs to do a restocking project. And also um, 113,000 to import giant clams from Palau so that we can begin a community-based management project, teaching the community to manage our natural resources so that there's more of a, a sense of ownership and protection for the resources. Next slide, please. Our forestry and soil resources section, um, we've been 
somewhat successful in filling some of the positions for forestry. Uh, we've been able to secure a program coordinator for that has assisted the forestry chief. We promoted one longtime um, personnel who had been at a forester one position for several years and he's now promoted to a forester two. We're in the, in the process of recruiting an additional two forester twos and two forestry aides as well. Next slide. In addition to the funding that they received in 2021, which is $338,000 that they're in the process of expending, this year brought about $305,000 in, in new funding, but there's also additional funding for operations that is coming to forestry in the form of the infrastructure uh, bill that, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that um, many of the federal agencies are still trying to figure out how to distribute to local state agencies. Um, so their process hasn't been established yet, but we're aware that there will be several hundreds of thousands of dollars coming down to our forestry section, primary to, primarily to address uh, wildland fires, because that's been a huge issue nationwide. So that specific issue received millions, tens of millions in federal funding, if not hundreds of millions actually. So Guam will see a really nice chunk of that. Um, and then below that is the breakdown of the grant funding that's accumulated and or come through that section since 2018. Interestingly enough, most of it came in 2020 when everyone was down with the COVID. Um, so they've been expending that up to this point. So it's not money that's just been carried over, but they've been expending it substantially. Next section, next slide, please. Conservation officers, one of the most exciting um, growths that we've seen in the agency in the last three years is our ability to recruit and promote within our conservation officers who've done an outstanding job, um, as additionally with the support of this legislature for the volunteer conservation program, which has led to recruitment of some of those individuals to, be, uh, to serve as permanent conservation officers. Um, right now, we are in the process of still filling two positions and an additional six positions that were funded through ARP money. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. For this year, the conservation officers spent about close to $600,000 on personnel, $58,000 in operations. Um, it'll stay pretty close to that for next year. Um, and they also have 1.5 million in ARP money, thankfully, um, to build themselves a, an, a law, enforce, law enforcement office, which they don't have. Their old office was condemned, and they were then moved into a DAR-funded building, which became an audit finding because they're not DAR staff. <laughs> So the building serves as a double solution, providing them with a secure space. In the DAR building, they can't even bring in um, arrestees to properly book them or question them because they don't have the space for that. They didn't have a suitable evidence locker um, or any of those, those items that you think of when you think of a law enforcement section. So this funding will be able to give them the building that they need um, and additionally provide uh, they want to use whatever residual fundings to build a boathouse to store the, um, I think there's two different boats that they have. Next slide. Since we're so intrinsically tied to GAIN, I just wanted to provide just brief information about um, our GAIN partner in that their annual appropriation um, has remained consistent, I think for the last two to three years. Um, and then just the annual expenses that we provide in covering their um, utilities because of their aging infrastructure, it can sometimes lead to quite an extensive amount. Um, and on the very last slide, you will see a summation of our local funds and federal funds for the total operational budget for the Department of Agriculture. And with that, um, that concludes my presentation and do you have any questions? Welcome 
Senator Taitegui and Senator Brown. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Director. I was about to recognize my colleagues that have joined us. And it, it's just amazing that uh, you're asking for only 110,000 and you've got 20, 20 million in grants. We're pretty proud of that. Um, yes, you should be. Yeah. You're one of the very few agencies I know of that bring in, gosh, never mind the percentage, that's 20 million, period. And I hope that in the future you're able to get more. Um, we try, we push, that's what we constantly push for is we're out there looking for funding and then even if we have to sit with staff individually to help them learn how to write the proposals, that's what we've been doing. Great, great job, great job. Um, Gosh, uh, you know, we, we did provide you some of the questions that we, we would want you to ask, answer, but um, it appears you've answered it. So with that, Senator Tello, do you have any questions for the panel? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And to my colleague, Senator Brown, and most especially to the Department of Agriculture. And yes, I'm very impressed about the grants. It's one of the things I think it's, uh, which is about 50% or more of your operations uh, in grants. So congratulations. And Thank you. Well, I never doubted you, Chelsea, when it came, <laughs> comes to uh, being able to find these federal fundings. You've had a lot of experience in it, and that's why I was confident that uh, taking the position as director uh, that you've done these years, uh, you were able to prove me right. <laughs> so thank you for that. And of course, to the staff. Um, Behind every great person, uh, there's um, people behind them who support them and make the, things happen. So uh, thank you to everybody at Department of Agriculture. Absolutely. For all your work. And please send the message to them for me <laughs> that uh, we thank them. And I want to thank you, Senator. I recall, I think it was the last budget hearing um, where you had asked a question. And I think I remember commenting that you know, if you give us that little bit of support, that little bit of bump, I promise we will come back and deliver. And that's what we've tried to do is stick to that. Um, and so that's, that's been the push and the impetus for uh, finding more funds that we can use to better serve our community in any way that we can. Okay. Well, I'm glad it paid off. Um, speaking of which, the little bump that you talked about, uh, this year you're requesting for a, a, more money, right? And if I'm not mistaken, is it 110,386? That's right, right? Yes. And did you mention what that money will go to, the funding will go to? Um, we put that primarily into personnel, largely. Um, some of the sections like forestry and animal health, um, although forestry has brought in additional funds, it is used for operations. Um, We've actually just had a meeting with their federal grantor about that because we're not really able to use the money to hire personnel or to fund personnel, but more so for operations. They were even trying to um, explain to us how, how they've done it federally, where they use it to incentivize hiring of personnel whilst at the same time not covering personnel. So they use it um, as like, we'll pay for you to go to college if you come work for us, but then we can't use the money to hire the person that we want to pay to go to college. Um, and with the animal control section, while we repeatedly and consistently will continue to apply for federal funding, um, on that page you'll see that we have the DOI TAP grant that we submitted. That also, we, we use it um, primarily for supplies um, and operations, but the bump would go into hiring more animal control officers. I think um, we've done a great job um, and absolutely with this legislature's support in building up our conservation officers and our agriculture development services. Um, and as, a, as an example of that, this year, uh, when Ms. Tony and I were talking about it, Agriculture Development Services between 2018 and 2021 brought in about $6,000 in nursery sales. Um, this year, because of the staff that are there and the excitement and the passion that they have, that is closer to $18,000 now in nursery sales just because of the amount of growth that we have. So what we'd like to do with this additional funding is start putting that into the animal control section and the forestry section. 
Okay. Um, Director, in, uh, in FY 2023, um, you have 15 locally funded vacant positions and 17 federally funded vacant positions. It's a total of 33 vacant positions. Uh, how many of the 15 locally funded positions remain vacant and budgeted for FY 2023 that are also in FY 2022? This is only local funds, yeah. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? If I'm not mistaken, you have about a total of 33 vacant positions, including um, right? Okay. And of that, 15 are locally funded and 17 are, are funded federally um, that are vacant positions. And I was wondering how many of the 15 locally funded positions remain vacant um, that was budgeted for in FY 2022? Um, and I apologize if I may have miscounted, but I had it at 13. But out of the 13, we filled 11 already. And we still okay. have, two, I think, three in recruitment right now. So we'll have filled, filled. all of the positions. OK, that's good to know. Because then, then you won't. So that leads me to the um, next question with regards to the federally funded positions. Um, some of these federal funds are, are getting ready to expire and um, at the end of this physical year, um, 17 of those position federally funded positions remain vacant. Um, so my question is, will the federal funds be returned and fulfilled with those positions that were not ever filled? Those 17 positions are with the Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources. Um, so the money wouldn't be returned, it would just be reprogrammed. But uh, oh, as good. I mentioned earlier, we're sort of walking carefully through that process of hiring those 17 positions because initially when the proposals are submitted, and this has been in prior years, the staff would always budget like one position per project, which is not always necessarily needed an exact one position per project. As a matter of fact, in one of the sections for under DAR, I spoke with the chief about um, giving some of the staff, because they'd only work on one project and then kind of be done for the day. So I think with some of them, they have over six or seven projects that they manage. So what the chief is doing is reconciling the actual work required for each project with the federal grant manager so that we can make sure we have a true accounting of the number of staff that is really needed. And if that number is higher than it needs to be, then we can reprogram some of that money into the operations of the project rather than having one project on the side with one biologist here and one project with one biologist here. We want to maximize their ability to handle more than one project. Okay, so in a nutshell, anything expiring can then be reprogrammed. Reprogrammed. Yes. So that's good to hear. Absolutely. You know, the mantra of the so agency true. is we're not returning funds. We're not returning funds. Yeah. We need to find a way to spend that. Right. But of the 17, how, how many did you say that was um, still vacant? Uh, of the federally funded? 12. 12 are still vacant. Yeah, the five is in, in, uh, in progress for okay. recruitment. Okay. Um, did you say you had an, entolo uh, an entomologist? Yes. Entomologist. Entomologist. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Chris, uh, wait, is he a doctor now? Not sure, right? No. Okay, so Mr. Chris Rosario. <laughs> Sorry about He's that. He's also the bee guy. Um, he is part of the, um, is it Guam Apiarists? Yes. Is that what they're called? The, the Beekeepers, oh no, the Beekeepers Association. I see. And the entomologist, is, is this uh, um, individual uh, paid by local fund or federal funds? Local funds. Okay. What's the amount that we pay for him or her or him? Yeah. Um, they're paid out, he's paid out of the Invasive Species Fund. Okay, that's, yeah. okay. It's under a special fund then, yes. correct? Okay, and is that trailing uh, pretty good? Is that tracking pretty good? Yes. Um, okay. So with benefits, it's 88506 Okay. But I believe that's also considered a law enforcement position as well. Exactly. Okay. Is that individual degreed? Yes. Okay. He has a master's degree. A master's degree? Okay. 
earned at the University of Guam. Bipa. Isn't this particular position, though, an entomologist, isn't that a position that need, need a doctoral for? No, it doesn't. Okay, there's nothing in the law that, that says it must be a doctor. Uh, no. Have a doc doctor's degree. Okay. With regards to the art funding that you mentioned earlier, um, the 1.5 I noticed here, but actually you received 3,390,439,400 3, yes. with an encumbered, you've only encumbered in the latest report as of May 31st, 2022, you've only encumbered 22,695, leaving you a balance of 3,316,765. That's what I have my latest report on. Um, I did notice that you have anticipating you using art funding, of course, for the six new positions. Mm -hmm. um, how much are you setting aside for that? Um, do you have that one paper, the art write-up? And while you're looking at that, and, and while you're looking for that, can you also give me the cost for the law enforcement office with evidence locker, as well as the cost for the boat warehouse? Sure. Just the breakdown. There. Okay. Oh, wait. No, do we have the one where I wrote it down? Oh, here. So the um, the boat house was budgeted, I believe, at around a hundred thousand, no. um, and the the office building is about seven hundred thousand. Um, but what I failed to mention as well is that. Um, we have a work request submitted for both of those, as well as a work request for the nursery expansion for ADS. So ADS was the recipient of the other um, 1.7. So we've submitted a work request for 800,000 for their nursery, and then the an additional. 80,000 for the. How much for the motor pool? The, the Oh, sure. Yeah, it was 80000 for the boathouse, 200000 to construct um, a motor pool. If you recall in prior, I think it was last year, we experienced several break-ins um, and thefts and damage to our uh, government vehicles. So we wanted to invest in a safe facility for tracking and keeping um, the vehicles housed together. And we already have the property, which is across the street from our main building, that's not being utilized. So the motor pool would just be built over that. And we were thinking, you know, a steel structure so it wouldn't be too expensive utilizing concrete. Um, and as I mentioned, the nursery has already been generating a lot of its own revenue and the only thing limiting it is the amount of space right now. Um, so we wanted to expand the nursery as an economic uh, revenue driver for that section particularly with the agency. So the nursery expansion I think um, was around $800,000. Right. right. And then um, 200,000 for the motor pool, 800,000 for nursery expansion, law enforcement, evidence locker, is that, and the boat warehouse, is that a combination of 700,000? You said 700,000 earlier. No, the nursery itself is the 800,000. Right. The boathouse is 80,000. The motor pool was 200,000. Um, and then the conservation building was 692,000. So I was estimating it at about 700. Um, That's and, the, the law enforcement office evidence locker. Yeah, well, they'll have an evidence locker within their office, yes. Okay, that's 692. Yes. Okay. And Almost then yeah. um, there are vehicles and equipment that we also have funds set aside for that we're going to initiate with the next procurement cycle um, with uh, sawmills for our forestry section so that they can start. Um, creating lumber 
from the wood that they cut down uh, when they're thinning through the acacia trees and other trees that we plant. We're looking at creating a revenue uh, within the forestry section as well and the work that they do and uh, the obvious low hanging fruit is to create timber from the wood that can be used for furniture building or charcoal if someone was so innovative and inclined. Um, and then to buy an additional, I think one forestry fire truck um, and two four wheel drive trucks for the ADS section for when they do um, farm inspections because they don't have operating official vehicles right now. So what about the six new um, uh, recruits? Oh, that was about 65,000? Yeah. yeah. Times six, is that what you're looking at? Um, because it says six. Recruits. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 742,000. Okay, $742,000 for these six recruits, right? Yes. And this funding is gonna be able to cover six new recruits. For two years. For two years. Yes. Okay, and this is art funding. Yes. Okay. Are you having an, anticipating any lapses um, at the Not, end of this year? Did you have any lapses in 2021? I'm sure we probably did. Um, but I think we've been a lot more diligent this year about ensuring that we spend um, the money as much as we can for the personnel that we need. Um, okay. you Chelsea, recall, can you... Director, can you tell me um, that amount if you don't have it with you? I don't have that amount, but we can find that and I'll send that to you. Can you also, since you're looking in that, those numbers, can you also look for 2020 as well? You know, because a lot of times what's happening in these agencies are not closing out the end of their years. So if you still have money that's in your account for 2020 that, has not, that was carried over and not expended, you, you haven't closed the books on that. So 2021, if you haven't closed the book, so it's important to know if all that money that was lapsed has been expended, how much of that um, was given in lapse and where, where you spent that money. I know that- um, It's usually lost a lot of times. Well, for Mrs. Santos and I, we, that's actually a conversation that we've had. So we've been cognizant of the fact that there may have been lapse funds in 2020 and whatever was left from 2021, we've talked about that she's expended. Yeah, that also includes uh, uh, positions that the, the legislature has appropriated for these vacant positions, but you never filled. And then you're coming over for the next year, budget year, requesting for the same position and the same a lot, uh, appropriation when you never even spent the one for the prior year. So really important to get those numbers um, and to try and close your books for those particular years to stand on. The other one is on the transfer authority. I noticed that the governor uh, w was transferred out of your operations $250,000 on April 4, 2022. And then um, 11,784 was also transferred out on March 8, 2028 on that report in 2020. Another was transferred out for 3,752 from the Co conservation officers report in, in March 8, 2022 as well. So there are quite a few transfers out of your agency. Um, are you getting that money back? Are you, you know, I mean, it's obvious someone wants to borrow some money for something else, you know. Um, have you requested for this funding back? Um, I have not seen that report, so I'm not sure uh, what I can say about that. But I do know that when mm -hmm. we've asked for support um, in the way of personnel or um, with any additional funding, they've been, the governor has been able to support, uh, provide that and support us as we've needed. Mm -hmm. So in one way or another, it comes back. Okay, because Chelsea, you're asking for 110,000 only, right? $110,386 only, but yet they took out $250,000 out of your account. There's the money you need, you know, to bring that back in, so you might want to ask them if they plan on returning that money. I mean, this legislature appropriates you. We give the governor transfer authority. We understand that. But um, if any agency is coming before us asking for additional money f compared to what they received last year, mm -hmm. 
They need to go back and find out, well, why are you short or why do you need additional money? So I appreciate if you can uh, look into that. And Mr. Chair, did sure. you have anything to say on? <laughs> I saw you grabbing your mic. I was wondering if there was. Okay, so uh, other than that, Mr. Chair, I think um, that's the, pretty much the logist of some of my questions, the carryovers, of course. Um, do you have any uh, increases in um, salary or the uh, pay increases for your law enforcement? Yes, we did. And how much was that total for FY22? It wasn't much. I think it was about 56000 $52,000. For FY22, correct? Yes, we don't have that many staff, so. Okay. And then for next year, um, how much will that total? Because you're only going halfway through the year. and so How much would that be for next year, that additional cost? Well, it shouldn't be much more. I mean, their 18% their was implemented in February? January. Okay. January. Right. So it's okay. for most of the year. Okay. So it's about 100000 maybe. Mm, if about, it's halfway. A little yeah. under that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, other than that, well, thank you so much. Again, extend my Don Lucy Dusmasi to the staff over at Department of uh, Ag, and uh, thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate Absolutely. it. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. All right. Thank, thank you, Senator. You. Thank you, Senator Tidy. I'd like to also recognize Senator Parrish to join us. Um, Senator Brown, do you have any questions for the panel? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and certainly good morning to our director from Department of Agriculture and your staff uh, for being here for your budget hearing. With regards to your, your staffing pattern on your unclassified, you have listed four, in, four positions that are unclassified. What are those? I mean, aside from yourself, your deputy, um, who are the other two? Um, one is a clerk with our animal control section. Um, who is our fourth unclassified? It might have been a PC4 in our ADS section that's already, since this time, has converted um, into a classified position. She successfully applied and competed for the um, open recruitment position. I'm asking only because I've noticed there have been government agencies that have been putting unclassified employees, even in the interim, in classified positions, and I don't know legally how that's allowed. So under what authority would you have? Because normally you simply have the director, a deputy, maybe a, you know, in the case sometimes of boards, they have a board secretary that's unclassified. Mm -hmm. What position did that individual hold in an unclassified capacity before they supposedly converted to classified? Uh, the same position. Um, when she was initially picked up as a LTA, um, or for, I guess, both of them. There was no current listing for the position, but the section was just in dire need of staffing. So then we filled it with an LTA um, and then openly recruited the position with DOA, and then they had to apply, get rated, get listed, yeah. and go through all of that. You know, I, I definitely understand the need for personnel when you have an operation, but this is probably something we're going to need to look into because this is becoming a little commonplace. I don't know what legal authority you have to take an individual who does not qualify per position and just simply put them there until they can qualify and then hire them. They, we don't get it. That's, that's not the process. So in order to even be picked up as an LTA, they have to submit their resume and be profiled by DOA first to ensure that they qualify for the position. Then why are they hired this limited term and not simply hired through the regular process? Just because it's a more expedited process to hire them as a limited term while we're announcing the open position. I mean, to process a limited term Person. But what are the qualifications to be limited term? I mean, they have other, to meet the do same. other people also compete to be a limited term employee in the hiring process? They can, um, but they, their, their resumes have to be submitted to DOA in order to profile them against the position description. Again, I just think this is something we need to look into because you, you have a very small number, but in comparison to other agencies that we're seeing, come before us for the budget, um, we're seeing a number of those things being added. And again, if we want to have any so-called merit process, um, you know, pretty much for an administration, the governor has the latitude of their own personal staff at Adeloupe, their directors, perhaps the deputy if it's authorized by law. If it's a board, normally they're allowed a board secretary. And that pretty much is about it. Uh, but when you look at some of these other positions that have hiring, I, I'm a little concerned about that because again, that goes about goes around the process. 
You mentioned you had another clerk position. Yes. Is that the fourth person? Yes. And what does that individual do? Um, she assists with processing entry permits and um, animal health certificates and complaints from the community for the animal health section. And this is also another LTA? Yes. And how long has that individual been in that position as an LTA? I, I think about two years. I will say though, Senator, I mean, I understand, I completely understand what you're saying and your, um, where you're coming from, but like for an agency like ours, it's been, it's been a lifesaver to be able to pick up LTA positions. Um, and we always ensure that, uh, or we try to do our best to ensure that when there's an open recruitment, then we encourage those LTAs to apply for that. But as an example, like our, our conservation officers, um, we went from having four to six and then eight. And for when we got to six, we did that with the LTA um, hiring of those two conservation officers. And it took close to eight months, I think, or six months to get the open recruitment listing for the other two. Mm -hmm. And even at that, they had over, I wanna say over 30 applicants to DOA for the conservation recruits, of which only five qualified. So being able to utilize an LTA in that time, it's, it's, it's been a tremendous help. No, I, I understand, and maybe the system's broke, or DOE's gonna tell us they don't have enough people to do the evaluations, I'm sure, because they're, they're doing it for, the, for, for all, all of the line them. agencies, yeah. and maybe there's a better way to help facilitate that. But just in all fairness, so the, mm -hmm. so the process is not abused. And then, and then it's also a means sometimes it's used to have select people that you desire to qualify so that they can say, oh, I have the experience, I've been in this position for five years now as an LTA. Um, and we should have a time limit probably on, on limited term appointments because that's what they're supposed to be. And yet we'll find in the government that they've been there four or five, six years as an LTA. Um, so I, I just think as a practice, it's something that probably uh, we need to look at and determine what the parameters are and how long that process should continue. So it helps facilitate. If it's a qualified individual, then that should be announced so that everyone else who has the capability or interests can in all fairness apply because otherwise, it's really not fair, right? Because somebody out there may have general uh, capability of applying, but you know they weren't in that LTA position for the last two or three years, so who's gonna get the job? Odds are fairly good. The person that's been sitting there for two or three years that's mm -hmm. known in the department is probably gonna be the one that's going to be picked up. So you know, it's just, it's just to keep, supposedly, again, I, I have a big question mark in my mind about some of the legitimacy of the merit process in the government of Guam, because we know how some people get hired. Uh, but nevertheless, that's not the bigger issue for you at the Department of Agriculture. How are things coming along? I see your listing here of your biosecurity division. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how does this coming into play now with your, your, your employees in your position versus customs? Because historically, of course, when PPQ was extracted out of Department of Agriculture, which I don't think turned out to be a good outcome. I mean, ultimately, it did not work out with regards to the more focused interest of, of the work that PPQ was providing uh, for the community. And of course, we just see, as we continue to see, an increase of invasive species mm -hmm. coming into the yard. Now our people see it out in the community. They see it out in their yard. The farmers definitely see it out there. And you know, when they're, they're, they're doing their planting and, and they're trying to figure out what's the next thing that they have to work against because it's affecting their crops. Um, what additional support, because PPQ, when it was transferred into customs, they seem to have maintained all those resources, including the funding. And now we have to have this separate funding that's helping you know, fund your current biosecurity division, which essentially all you're doing is trying to recreate you know, what you used to have 20 plus years ago. So now that this is in place, what, what are you seeing with regards and, how, and how, are you, how are you assigning your people with inspections at the airport or at the port? How is that working out so far? It's still a work in progress. Um, we've been trying to recruit for the commodity inspector section. Uh, before I say that, I just wanna say though that I'll be number one champion and advocate for giving DOA more staff for their <laughs> HR section. They are absolutely stretched as thin as possible given that they're covering all of the GovGuam line agencies. Um, I fully support that, but I think they do a tremendous job and they're always very happy and helpful. Um, but yes, I, that's a very, 
astute summation of what happened with the PPQ and our biosecurity section. So we're, in a sense, trying to rebuild that section. Um, the projects that Dr. Dula has and that he's worked for generally are more to sort of address or treat the issue that's already here. Um, one of the front lines that we need are our commodity inspectors. We've had an open recruitment for that for about six to eight months, and we had one applicant that we picked up, and I've asked them for, I've asked DOA for the next certified list, um, but it's an incomplete list because they don't have enough applicants. I think they have two pending, so it's been a challenge recruiting for that. Um, what, we're, what I've now instructed our sections to do is when we know our position's being announced, we start advertising it ourselves on all our social media. I mean, we've always done the, yeah. we send it so out to outreach, all of our yeah. partners, uh -huh. but you know, we're all talking to the same group of people. So what's been, I think will be a lot more helpful is sending it out to social media. And every section has of our agency has been instructed to have their own social media, all with sort of a unified name like they'll all be whatever their section, dot DOAG, um, forestry and DAR are each at over like a thousand followers. So then they help, and I think ADS is getting up there. So it's been helpful and biosecurity has been growing um, in followers and outreach too. And I love having our agency events like the um, we hold two Earth Day events annually. Um, that's been a really great way for interacting with the community and showing what each of the different positions do. Um, so I think that we can, we'll see an uptick in the number of people who start applying for positions at our agency. And it's, it's a great place to work, but it has been challenging. Um, commodity inspectors, I think, are one of the frontline positions that are absolutely needed for the biosecurity section. Well, and plus, you know, to have the, the training that they have to know what to look for, which I think, yeah. you know, and I, I, customs, of course, I mean, adding this on for them, and again, this came at a time after 9-11 when there was a national move to start consolidating all the, every, anything and everything in the border under one umbrella, but, but the consequence of that, unfortunately, is, you know, you have a custom inspectors looking for illegal drugs and contraband and then at the same time, you know, holding up their, and I've seen this, literally holding up their card of different type of insects, you know, to determine whether or not, you know, the next batch of flowers that came in for the flower shop or the orchids or the fruits or the vegetables, you know, it's, it's and that's one card by that, right? That, their that's, binder uh, is actually like that. Thick. Yeah, that's a lot <laughs> to look for. And especially if it's not really your background or what you specialize in. People yeah. that have this, it's like instinctive. They already know what to look for. Uh, and it's not just an insect, you know. It could be mold. It could be something else. It could be a virus yep. uh, that comes in. And then, and then here it is, and it's spreading throughout the community. So, and right now, with regards to your, your staffing, do they, do they work hand-in-hand -hand with customs? Are they boarding a vessel? Are they looking at containers? And the other thing, too, at the airport, I mean, I, even though I know they have rooms where you can go and take things and look at, um, when, you, when you actually go up there, they have that big roll-up door that's always open. So if I was an insect and I, I got out of a box or something, my first desire, I assume, is going to be to fly out of there. And so it's not really contained, even though I like say, oh, we're, we're on the, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, I'll figure that no, out. But, but how, are do, how do your inspectors go and do their work? Even like I said, we're doubling up and Custom still remains, I assume, holding the funding. And we'll yes. have to go back and look at that. If they're still being funding their officers and yet we're having to recreate this division back under Department of Agriculture. And I'm supportive of that. I really believe it should have stayed and should continue to stay with you guys, even though, you know, at the time, a lot of crazy things were happening in the United States with 9-11 and, and these, you know, rash decisions were made. Um, A silver lining to that entire process is that the PPQ officers that they had, a few of them are still there. So they have the longevity and they've built up their knowledge and they have a great working relationship like with our invasive species coordinator. So anytime they see something, they're quick to call him um, or have him report. Our commodity inspectors have been, as I said, we hired one new one right now. Um, they've been doing a great job with inspecting things that come down to the plant inspection facility. Um, and then they just, they get called by customs if there's something questionable. 
Um, that's kind of the relationship right now. But uh, are, but are your, your commodities inspectors there every time an inspection is being done or only no. on occasion or only and then if they're called? Yes, it's occasionally and if they're called. What we would like to see is when we can build up the commodity inspector numbers is have them at the airport and the port facility, which the director of customs has indicated he's fully supportive of. Um, especially when they get to build their new facility, but they, we would like to have them return to the airport, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think I'd, I'd like to see that too. I'd like to see them work hand in hand with regards to the inspection so that they know what they're looking at because unfortunately we end up being more reactive and then it's, it still costs money and yeah. then we end up with the consequence, unfortunately, of more invasives uh, you know, entering uh, into our community. With regards to your, your, uh, your funding, I know that we had passed legislation to fund uh, the spay and neuter clinic. Were you able to receive that funding? Is that being put in place? To yes, we received that issue the funding. With our stray dog population. Does it also include, do we also have people who in the community that can come and have their, their pets spayed if they're, yes. they're not? Do they get it for free? Do they get a discounted rate? Maybe they get it at an extremely discounted rate. Um, what we have done is, in the process of receiving the funds, which we did receive, um, we worked with the AG's office and figured out uh, and were advised that the current existing contract that the Department of Agriculture had with GAIN was not actually lawful. And if you read through some of the, because I don't, it was written in what, the 90s, I think? Or early 2000s, some of the sections and the language in it, when the AG points, or the Assistant Attorney General pointed it out, it was, it, were, it did have issues that needed to be addressed and changed. So we had to rewrite it, create an MOA, route that for signatures through everybody. We got that in place, and then um, we submitted a work order to process the payment to gain, um, and that's sitting with the Department of Administration right now. Uh, they're figuring out how to process the work request because a work request is typically with between GovGuam agencies, and although GAIN serves a function as a pseudo GovGuam agency, they're not one. Um, so we're working with the um, Department of Administration on that, but GAIN already has uh, a spend plan that they've submitted that we've reviewed together and approved. They set aside $250,000 to build, um, I think, 70 new kennels that will address the issues that face the mayors plus the public. Um, and our animal control officers. Uh, they have 130,000 set aside for supplies. Um, and then the remaining roughly 70,000, 60 of it is to hire a supplemental veterinarian who was already working. She was already there working in place with our new territorial veterinarian that we were able to hire. Um, our new veterinarian, Dr. Turner, is skilled and trained in high quality, high volume spay neuters. So together with Dr. Smith from Gain, they, in a matter of a couple of months, I think, they knocked out over close to 300 backlog spay neuters for gain, and now they're working on a waiting list that has just accumulated in the last two months, basically. But it's from the community, so it's people who already have pets but are right. signing up. And gain is figuring out their pricing, but I know it's extremely cheap. I believe it's under $100, which is a relief to just about everybody because it's kind of really costly otherwise. Um, well, I, I even noticed in the, in the, in the current cl veterinary clinics, it can take months. They have it's backlogs It's backlogged themselves. by months, and not always used not to be that way. Normally, you can make an appointment the following week, and yeah. now I see it could be two to three months or more. And if you miss it, then you're out of luck for another two or three months. Are you able to use with the funding? Can you hire additional veterinarians, uh, or can they can gain, are they, do they have the flexibility of hiring additional vet? Narians part time to they maybe did set aside the backlog or they that's what Dr. Smith's purpose is right now. Um, she's she's I think she just moved on island, so she'll be here for a few years at least. And she loves the work and um, the mandate of or the mission of gain. So she's been really helpful there. And she and Dr. Turner have a great working relationship. And what our outreach activities have shown us, especially with Dr. Turner, who's excited to be out there in the community and engage with our animal control officers in the community, is that the community's ready. They're ready to receive when we can move out into the community outreach program. She's been working with Dr. Uh, Leo Liu at um, 
the University of Guam, who's the animal scientist, to facilitate bringing Taiwanese veterinarians over to help as well. So she's moving on several different um, opportunities right now. And the end goal in mind is to implement a community-based outreach spay-neuter program where we can, like we saw at EPAL, um, at our Earth Day activity, and then also at a life skills event that we had, people wanted to bring their pets in to get microchipped and get rabies vaccinations. So it's not a matter of forcing them to do it, it's just creating the opportunity and they'll come. Well, I appreciate the, the effort and the work you're putting into this because I think we realize it's something that needs to be continuous. Uh, you know, many of us love our pets, but uh, not everyone has the opportunity or the resources to be able to provide them the things that they need, particularly addressing uh, the spay and neuter clinic. During the pandemic, did you see any increase of activity with regards, and I understand that a lot of our, our farmers were concerned about their ability and, and did have challenges in some cases of selling their crops during the pandemic, but now that as we're, as we're crawling out of it, do you, do you see any increase of farming activity in our community? Oh, in tremendously. In comparison to where we were a year or two ago and, and interest in farming? Let's see. We, in 2020, what, um, what we had that section do was, since we're working from home and we weren't really engaging with the community as much or didn't have the opportunity, we saw that as an opportunity to scrub our bona fide list. Because for years, you know, it's just gone back and forth. And, and understandably, John Borja only had himself really um, to kind of do that. He didn't have an administrative staff. He had Mr. Terlahi and they would go out and do farm inspections, but they had this massive monster bona fide database. Um, and some of the farmers in there had already even died or just didn't farm anymore. So in 2020, we spent that time scrubbing through the list and brought it down to about <clears throat> under 400. It was like 375. And those were verifiable, bona fide farmers that they spoke with who were current and kept up their information and they reached out to everybody. As of today, that list is now at 798. And so it's also because um, through the legislation that you, you guys helped us to pass, where we required if you're gonna sell commercially, you needed to be bona fide. So people were registering, but we also created that subsection where if you're a home-based farmer or a gardener, but you're providing food for your family, you can also register as a bona fide farmer. You would just identify yourself as subsistence. So we opened it up and people have been responding. And yeah, and that, that's also, I think, a testament to the sales at our nursery. Our nursery guy that we were able to hire um, when you gave us the funding to do so has created like a Willy Wonka playland of fruits and vegetables at the nursery. We see more foot tra traffic than ever before. I think at one point um, he grafted over 50 avocados um, of a, of a strain that he had that was like Hawaii's best avocado. So he grafted these onto 50 different other avocado plants and he, they figured out a price internally at $25. Come to find out from Dr. Dula that most grafted plants sell for like $150. But in, I think it was a matter of two days, they had over $1,000 in sales. Wow. So he, I, I want to get one. You need to come visit. I tell everybody, come visit our nursery. Your mind will be blown. Yeah. He's creating mother plants for everything from macadamia nuts to there's this fruit that he always, I think it's called like a Jody, Jody Cabra or something, but I always call it Chupacabra because that's the only word I can remember. And, you know, Chupacabra is that like Mexican rabbit goat monster, <laughs> but he's, he's created a wonderland of our nursery, which is why we need to expand it. But that has contributed to the increase in the number of people who want to farm. They follow their Instagram page. They see all of the different things they have available. Every Monday, I think they post a new story. Um, and the, the bona fide list and the nursery sales have been rising um, conjunctly. Yeah, that's good to hear. And it's good to hear that you know, there's a growing interest in our community. I mean, because, yeah, we have typhoons and we have invasive species, but it is possible, you know, to actually, and even people, like you said, can do it as subsistence and do it at, you know, at a small scale. Um, but, and to take it to another step, um, 
<clears throat> together, he, um, with our, some of our other staff in the section, um, have created a list of high cash value crops. And that's what they're, they're growing um, or they're starting to get mother plants for so that we can help our community. Even if you wanna be a subsistence farmer, even at that, you're always gonna have more than you need. So why not be able to turn and sell some of that to farmers co-op? And if it's a high cash value crop, then it's worth your time and investment. Can you just, I, I'm not gonna go too much long because I have one other set of questions, but can you just elaborate so that the members of our community can know what's the benefit of being recognized as a bona fide farmer? Absolutely, so as a bona fide farmer, <clears throat> it opens you up to the ability to apply for um, micro grants with us. You can become a farmer with the farmer's co-op because you need to be bona fide in order to do that. You're able to sell your produce commercially um, even at the flea market or to the stores or to the hotels. We just had an amazing meeting yesterday with um, the University of Guam Cooperative Extension, Dr. Barber and Marco Costa, and the head of um, the Micronesia Chefs Association, and then Farmers Co-op, and um, they were we were all there talking about just ideas for how to get more local produce and fruits and vegetables into everywhere, um, and so we. The conclusion was that we need a constant ongoing synergistic partnership and anytime you have something that's in abundance for yourself, whether it's eggs, bell peppers, or chupacabra, you can take it and sell it to the farmer's co-op and then they can distribute that to whoever needs to be. So it's really easily, easy to go from just growing for yourself to being able to make a few bucks on the side if you need to help supplement your income. Um, and then we just become less reliant on all the imports and everything tastes way better when it's fresh from okra to uh, Chef Peter Duane was talking about how he picked figs off of his tree and who knew figs grew on Guam? Apparently it, they do and they grow well and when he spread that on his bread and his wife freaked out that how delicious that was. Um, fresh eggs, everything, every, I, sorry I could go on and on, everything is just better fresh. No, I appreciate that. I, I assume your, your bona fide farmers are still able to apply for discounted water rates? Yes, absolutely. Last question section I wanted to ask with regards to your conservation officers. I certainly appreciate the fact you have your recruits, you have four of them, and you're looking in with your, your temporary federal funding, adding on additional ones. But certainly, I have to say your numbers are probably the lowest that they've been in either quite a long time or ever. Mm -hmm. You know, to only have four existing uh, mm -hmm. conservation officers in place, this is, you know, normally, I mean, the high was almost like 1920 conservation officers, and now you're down to four with four recruits, plus another six you're hoping to be able to get on board. And Mr. Chairman, I point this out because as I look at the, the compensation amounts, of course, your more senior officers are receiving about 51000 and up. Their overtime is only $1,000, and of course they have their specialty pay that's calculated depending on their base salary. But I mean, if you look at this versus some other agencies we've looked at, Mr. Chair, including the Guam Fire Department, uh, this budget pales in comparison. Because we have, you know, I, and not that Guam Fire doesn't perform a very important task, but if you look at the number of them versus the amount of money that they have for specialty pay and overtime, it's on average of forty to fifty to sixty thousand dollars a firefighter on top of their base pay. Wow. Even the assistant firefighters, some are earning goodness almost as much as a <laughs> head of a hospital. You know, if you look at responsibility. So I'm just gonna point this out because I, I've always been an advocate for the conservation officers. They've kind of been left off in the side. I mean, they, pour, they, they provide a very important job in this community. They do, they're out there literally in the jungle sometimes doing enforcement work late at night with limited resources. Um, and yet, you know, they, they, they're not up to par even though the requirements for them to become a conservation officer are no different than these other law enforcement positions. And I think this is something we need to strengthen, support, uh, I know last term we did provide the additional positions, but again, your numbers are still relatively low. What, what are you looking for to have what you would consider, again, nothing's ever enough, <laughs> but what would you look at in terms of a, a, a good number of conservation officers? Because your, your jurisdiction that you have is quite substantial. Absolutely. Obviously, it's the entire island. Um, and the ocean. 
Yes, yes, yes. Protect those marine preserves. <laughs> um. Um, 20 would be a sweet spot. Right mm -hmm. now, with the number that we have, they basically can have one shift. Um, we'd like to have 24-7 coverage, which requires three shifts. So if we have eight right now, I mean, 20 would make that even much more, at a reasonable number, to say conservatively 20, we can have three shifts. Um, Lieutenant Rigadio and I have talked about that. That would be the ideal. And thank you for recognizing their their need for overtime. Um, even that limits it because they can be out in the field and then they've hit their max and yeah. they want to stay out there, but well, you Well, know, and, and again, I mean, maybe Mr. That? Chair, that's something that can be looked at because this to me is really uh, not a substantial amount. I mean, this, the work that they perform for our community and I mean, it's not just addressing, you know, anything with regards to agriculture, to wildlife or, you know, stealing bananas, I mean, you know, when the time comes, some of their some of their work that they do. I mean, they come upon people that are armed. They Absolutely. come upon people that are dealing drugs, and then you know the whole issue of the connection between even most people don't think about it. When I was made aware of this, you know, the fact that a lot of illegal and illicit activity actually begin in the process of trying to generate money through a using or abusing natural resources and selling them and taking that money to do yep. other illicit things with them, and that. You know, I, I want to make sure we have a good number of conservation officers because, again, that's additional background and support for other law enforcement in the community when things happen. And, and their work is important, and I think we need to support that. And I don't think $1,000 for an entire year of work, considering how limited they are, because we hear DOC, they don't have enough officers. Guam Police, they don't have enough officers. But when you're down to barely eight and, and the remaining four are just recruits that are learning and just starting, and all we're giving them is $1,000 of overtime to cover 365 days a year, uh, this provides us no support or even them existing support for just the eight that are here. So I hope, Mr. Chairman, we can look, since we're so generous with other agencies because of the larger numbers and political influence, and yet you know, we do with the park rangers from Parks and Rec, and when we deal with the conservation officers, you know, we're just barely getting their head above water in terms of providing them additional positions because they have dwindled from where they used to be. And um, I just don't think it's fair with the kind of work that they do, and because there's so few of them, especially for those officers that are willing to work the time, in this particular case, I don't think it's excessive uh, to look at what support we can provide to increasing this amount um, for their overtime and hopefully we can work on expanding additional positions so that we can get to not a perfect level but a comfortable level uh, to ensure that we have protection of our natural resources in our community and with that mr chair that concludes my my questions and thank you chelsea i have to tell you um you know your continued passion this is probably as you mentioned the most exciting job you will ever have and I, I felt like that when I was at Guam EPA 30 plus years ago, when I was young and still had the drive. I, you know, it, it was always my favorite job, if I'm asked. I will always tell you that's my most favorite job. And I, I appreciate your energy and your passion for what you do, because that really, in your leadership role, makes a big difference for all the people that are working with you. A lot of classified employees after time, they get really jaded. Mm -hmm. And directors come and go, and the political nonsense continues. and those that hang in there are just biding their time and counting their days till they retire. And you don't get a lot of productivity when that's the drive. So certainly wish you continued success with the work they're doing. You have a lot under your hat, uh, but I think you're, you're, you're doing a lot of wonderful work and I, I wish you continued success with that. Thank you so much, Senator Brown. Thank I you. do love my job. I'm, a lot. I'm happy to hear that. That really makes a big difference. With that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to comment and ask questions. Thank you, Senator Brown. Um, before I comment on reference to your personnel, I'd ask for Senator Perez if she has any questions, because I have a few questions I would, I would ask you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Director. Good morning, Ms. Santos, uh, Good morning, for being Senator. here today. Uh, I share many of the sentiments of my colleague, um, and I, I do see the, the positivity that you brought to the, the agency. I see it more like a revitalization happening. Uh, it's great to see um, many of the things, such as food security, is uh, something that I'm concerned with as well as my other colleagues, and it's great to hear that there's a lot of uh, 
uh, positive changes that are happening with the plant sales, um, with the bona fide farmers list, and the interest, I think, in general, uh, that the community is, um, is seeing that. And um, it's a great service that your, your agency is doing for, for the community. Um, but I think, too, it's like, um, it's important, uh, how, can you maybe perhaps develop a metric uh, to, to determine the food security, you know, how food secure Guam is? Has the agency looked at that um, as part of including in their budget? So it's funny that um, that's actually, that came up during the conversation yesterday between, uh, as I said, with the University of Guam and then Farmers Co-op and, and us, because we all track our farmers. Some of them overlap, some don't. Um, but farmers are not always uh, willing to give up the amount of food they're actually growing, even if it's to the co-op or necessarily to ourselves. But there's also um, an opportunity for us to help them learn to project as well, because you can plant 20 rows of whatever, and then you're supposed to estimate what that's gonna turn into in terms of weight um, and how many people that can feed. So what we were discussing is that we need a and even with uh, federal USDA was there as well, is that we need a consistent manner for all of our agencies and, and um, entities to be able to track the same information so that a farmer only has to input that information once. Um, and then that we can all somehow see it and be able to extrapolate from that. So at this time, I mean, we get semi-annual reports from our bona fide farmers. That's what helps them keep current. Um, but that just tells us how many heads of whatever you're raising, how many pounds of whatever you've planted, but it doesn't necessarily translate into everything that's been produced. You're giving an estimate. Um, so we all need to get better at creating a streamlined process of collecting and reporting that data for the farmers. So that's what we, part of what we were trying to figure out how to do yesterday. So sorry, that's a long version of saying no. <laughs> I think that's a great response because it shows that you're already thinking ahead and uh, looking at uh, ways to, to, um, to quantitate that. I think also the, um, the uh, contribution of the Farmers Cooperative helps to uh, develop that food security because instead of duplicating efforts, you know, there could be more of a collaboration Absolutely. On when and what is produced. Yeah, so, I mean, looking forward to all that, um, uh, I guess, progress. Uh, and I also see that, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that you have 20 million, you know, federal grants. Uh, that's, that's an amazing amount. Is this the most you've had or is this pretty consistent over the years? Uh, no, this year we had a, uh, yeah, Miss Tony said it's the most. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a steady bump, um, as I was explaining to um, Senator St. Augustine, that uh, we've been really driving our sections to learn every grant management class that comes up. It's an opportunity. I sign people up for it. Um, we're constantly scouring to see what's available. Every opportunity that becomes available, I'm emailing it to staff members or to, we had to pick up a program coordinator under the director's office because I'm writing grants too, and so now I need a coordinator to help me track those. I think under just my office alone, we have like four applications out, or proposals that are either in progress or already submitted. So we've been pushing that with each of our sections, and then with the staff that we pick up, I'm always absolutely adamant that they're, they're skilled and they're qualified and they know how to help their section grow and that they have that passion for it. So like one of the people we picked up, um, the assistant chief at DAR in just the last two weeks brought in a million dollars in three grants, um, all of them to restock our natural resources, uh, $500,000 to create a restocking process for a tuhung, the bumphead parrotfish, 113000 to purchase giant clam. Um, baby giant clams from Palau, and we're gonna create a community-based management system for that in Jotnia Maleso and in Alahan. And then a $435,000 grant partnership with um, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology to track and be able to address the shark depredation issues that our fishers are facing on island. And that was just in the last three weeks. And then ADS has um, two 
concurrently running micro grant programs running and they've just submitted a proposal for a third. Uh, they brought in um, last year or sometime last year we had the half million dollars for the farmer mental health. Um, working with BSP we got the $385,000 for a food bank that we want to open up at Tremoro Village. So we're constantly pushing the, the mindset of go out there and find the funding and I always tell them because then they start freaking out like how are we going to spend it I'm like you get the money we'll figure out you know what we need to do to make that happen because all it does is translate into services for our community and that's what we're here for so whatever we can bring in to find to do that we're going to take that opportunity that's amazing <laughs> I mean I'm thinking too like you know the zero waste bill that I've introduced you know is there a way to partner up with the Department of Ag in regards to uh, composting you know more residential composting uh, to help with the, um, the you know agricultural sector, is that something on your your list as yeah, well? Yeah, it was one of the uh, <laughs> one of the areas for funding that we brought up yesterday with um, Dr. Barber and Mark Acosta. Is we talked about all the training opportunities. He basically asked us, "What do you want? Like, what do you want to train?" And that was one of them: is community-based composting, but also because we both are like both our agencies agree that agroforestry is the way to shift. Um, in farming and what it is is it's even though it's a move forward it's really mm -hmm. a throwback mm -hmm. because all our ancestors they they forested or they farmed agroforestry you know you utilize the big trees to protect the little trees that protected the little plants and then you have less loss when you get inclement weather or a typhoon and we even saw this in Ponape when where they do actively agroforest that when a typhoon came through they ha hardly lost any of their crops rather than the mindset of, you know, that Western idea of farming. So we brought up agroforestry and really pushing and um, expanding the, the reach that we want to have in our community for that. But composting was a massive major part of it because, I mean, uh, and it was Chef Peter who had asked, what do I do with all the chicken manure? I'm like, I keep them in mobile tractors, so I move them around. And if they have to be in a cage or somewhere on solid ground, then we scoop up that manure and put it into the garden or we compost it with other food waste products. So that, I mean, we never, virtually never buy soil because we're producing it ourselves. Yeah, and that can be for everybody. Yeah, great, and, and I also see there's a lot of paper waste in the government. Um, is there any moves to, to maybe gather some of that from we the various do. agencies? Um, we do. Uh, <laughs> one of the biggest ones we had was when census finished, and we had tons of bags. But um, we collect it within our agency, and then uh, Pete Terlahi, he's the mm -hmm. maverick at collecting coffee grounds and shredded paper from other stores and agencies and then we we share it with wildlife because they use it for the birds the cocoa birds in the sea hick um, and the mice and then our nursery they use it chris our nursery guy he even grew pink mushrooms on shredded paper and banana mulch so, that's great yeah. okay so um moving on to the um, division of aquatic and wildlife resources i know they they took up the lion's share of the federal grants about 16 million of it and so i'm just thinking you know is that enough are you getting enough to actually support, the, you know, the listed species, protecting our listed species? Um, you know, what do you see as that uh, a, a, a initiative in that area? Well, it really helps when um, when Jeff helped create the uh, or revise the state wildlife action plan. He included because uh, Jeff is one of our greatest secret weapons and assets for resource protection with the work that he does with permits and federal consistencies and environmental consults because he, he loves his island. Um, so when he was working with uh, Chief, the former Chief Tino Ugun um, in developing the SWAP, the State Wildlife Action Plan, he included several species of conservation need um, that are not necessarily listed or protected but because he included in them, that gives us an opportunity to actively use funding to protect them. Um, and I know he's working like with your office on updating what we need for the endangered species list because it was, it was cumbersome before that about how we would have to update it. Um, and in DAR, we're shifting our biologists to do more science-based rather than operational type of projects and leaving the operational projects to our technicians so that they have an opportunity to 
move up from technicians into program coordinators and the biologists will be doing the science-based work. So right now, the people that we've um, hired who have projects there, I mean, they, they do it because they love the island. So I think, yes, we're doing a lot to make sure that we have projects that are supporting and protecting our natural resources and listed and endangered species. That's music to my heart. So <laughs> it's great Mine to hear. Mine too. <laughs> yeah, and so like the enforcement aspect too, I, I, I share the same concern that, you know, I know uh, recruiting conservation officers has been one of the uh, biggest uh, priorities, but it's, there seems to be um, some issues with that. But perhaps I know, you know, we had here the other day Department of Land Management, and they were able to uh, recruit people through training. So with partnering with GCC, they developed a course um, that was specific to surveying, and they were able to hire uh, those, those individuals through a boot camp. So, um, you know, maybe that's a recommendation I would have for Department of Ag is if there's a way to partner with Department of Ag, um, sorry, GCC, to put I together would, a curriculum. So that takes, I, I've thought about that, but not at that level. You're taking it a step further. But what I have wanted to do, and I've discussed this with EPA as well, is that we are regulatory agencies. We have people like the environmental inspectors and people like our technical guidance section that oversee the issuance of permits. Um, they impose conditions. Um, and even like our ADS section, when they go out and they do their farm inspections with EPA sometimes, they're operating in a regulatory capacity. We want to be able to not arm them, because arm's the wrong word, but empower them to be able to take action when it's necessary. Like we issue NOVs out of the department sometimes um, for when Jeff's, uh, when the technical guidance section sees that there's infractions, but we want to be able to put teeth behind that. So I think that takes it where we need to go maybe is work with GCC to create a course that, I mean, Jeff already knows his laws and his section and the bios who work under him will know the same thing, but I think that strengthens the opportunity or their ability to be enforcement um, at a different level, obviously, than police officers or conservation officers, but they need that ability because we need to be able to have an impact if they see violations that occur, like you know, a construction site that goes up without silt screens or heavy equipment vehicles that are supposed to be washed down on the site before they leave, but they don't, and then they track mud along the road. When you see mud all along the road and you know it's from a heavy equipment vehicle, that's actually a condition violation because then they're transporting potential invasive species. It's good to know. And then also, we, uh, we, uh, this legislature also passed law, Public Law 36-61, which basically expands the enforcement capability for illegal dumping, mm -hmm. which includes Department of Agriculture. And so um, the, the apprehending officer, the agency, would get 50% of that citation. So just to kind of encourage um, your conservation officers to also look out for that. Not, well. not just conservation, but our forestry, um, our forestry personnel, the wildland fire forestry personnel, because they have taken, um, they've become certified in criminal uh, arson investigation. Uh, we've deputized them. And so when they went to take their citation writing class, they did it with EPA for the purposes of illegal dumping. Um, and then I think our, our new recruits, conservation recruits, went through the same thing. So we are embracing that as part of our added, well, I mean, it was already there. We recognize when we see illegal dumping, so now we get to do something about it. Okay, great. And then the other thing is, you know, we've been working together on, on bills is regarding the coral reef protection. Uh, does the funding currently in the budget, would that suffice uh, to help to, to add to this enforcement? Um, is there enough money in the budget to support the enforcement of uh, ship groundings? Well, our coral reef program right now gets its funding from NOAA and from DOI. Um, it's the, the money that goes into it is not so much for enforcement, but more so for restoration activities. So then I would say no. Uh, maybe perhaps we can talk about that uh, at another time. But um, I think that's all my question. Actually, one more question. Invasive species uh, fund. Mm -hmm. So I think since you took over, there's been a, uh, you've seen an increase in the collections. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And um, 
Do you think there's a need for hazard pay for, for those individuals that actually do the inspections when they go on the, those uh, well, containers? The, those are the customs officers. Do they already get hazard pay? Um, not too sure, I think we... But that brings up a point. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, that like our technical guidance section, I'd like to open that up for consideration for hazard pay. Um, if you see the work that they actually do when they go out to do site inspections for construction sites, um, sometimes it's traversing through acres of un, uh, untouched land. Sometimes it's on cliff sides or when they're going out to do uh, federal consistency inspections or environmental cons consultations. It's treacherous, um, but that's, it's because it's kind of an administrative position, it's not really considered that. But in order to get to the administrative work, it requires an extensive amount of physical exertion and in dangerous, um, what do you call it, like dangerous habitat. Yeah, the reason why I ask, because uh, sometimes what they spray in those containers are pretty deadly. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I, well, I would think they would get it. Yeah, and I guess I, I would say then yes, then they should be considered for that because they need to wear proper protective equipment in order to be able to spray or enter those areas and that in itself indicates it's hazardous. Right, and then also I've noticed on your uh, listing of federal funds, uh, the Dono uh, eradication Mm -hmm. I think I'm glad to see that you got that funding. Um, yes. And is that going to be a multi-year grant? Um, I believe mm -hmm. it is, yes. Okay. And, and um, there's several federal agencies that are interested in seeing the success of the program, so I'm sure they'll make that available. Okay, yeah. I mean, eradication is such a huge program. It's, yeah. It's a difficult a difficult task, even though it's a small island, it's it's a difficult task to, to eradicate is. invasive species. Sometimes they say we should just remove all the endangered species and just burn it all. Oh. So then you could just get rid of all the snakes at one time. Uh, interesting. But it's semi-joking. Yeah, but still, the, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not 100%, right? Anything that we do, it's there's always something. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing is, so the 63, so the conservation officers that you have now, um, so sorry, in the budget uh, request that you have, there's 63 uh, total employees. Uh, what is the um, amount allotted to co conservation officers? Is that still eight? Because I counted eight in the staffing pattern. You mean, what is the amount in money? Uh, in number of employees. Oh. that you've uh, requested in the budget? Uh, two right now. Uh, two in additional ones? Yes. So a total right. of 10. Um, yes, and then six will come from the temporary uh, federal funding for two years. So eight total for conservation. So it'll bring their numbers up to 16. Okay. All right. I think, um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for responding to my questions and looking forward to all the progress that you're, you're, you've been you're making. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Burris. Director. Um, I think one of my colleagues asked the question: What are the benefits of being a bona fide um, farmer? I think you missed out a uh, real property tax break. Oh yes, that as well. It's it's a major. For anybody that's a self-sustaining uh, bona fide farmer, because that's the requirement, that's 80% of their real property tax yes. reduce. So it's a major impact for anybody paying uh, real property tax. On another note, on the, on the other issue, it was also mentioned about, I guess maybe the salaries, the compensation that your conservation officers get. Uh, are you going to be working with DOA on doing a... Uh, not a pay study, but maybe a read, maybe rewriting your job description for your mm. for your conservation officers, because they're similar to the uh, the federal folks that that do conservation, and if you write it in, in that fashion, it may work in the benefit of the conservation officers. If if you allow it to just uh, linger, you're not going to see a change. Mm -hmm. And like a couple of my colleagues and several people mentioned that 
conservation officer. I remember, I remember working with them when I was in the police department. As she mentioned, 30 years, I'm talking 40 years ago when I was a police officer. And, I, and they're, they're hardworking people. They are. And, and they are packing. They are packing, I know that, because I dealt with a lot of them. And, and um, if you only have 16 and you're looking at 20, I'm just surprised. Uh, I need to see that request so we can look at it in the budget because my colleagues understand what you need to deal with. You protect our, our marine reserve, you help, and you, you build an education campaign to everybody out there of what you guys do. And, and in addition to your forestry folks, um, you, actually, you actually back up GFD when it comes to fires. Yes. You're the folks that actually go into the jungle and kill the fires. Not that GFD, it's, it's you folks. Yes. And, and those are the mechanisms that need to come in place. When you mention empowerment, if you write it correctly, I know you can get with the post commission and you can put them in place. They may not be peace officers, a police officer, but they can be a post in the post, which be, uh, or correction, not law enforcement, but peace officers. Yes. And then they'll have the teeth that they'll need. Okay, and, and that could work to your favor. Another one I'm concerned about is that, you know, we have a, I know you support the, the farmers out there. You mentioned the farmer's market. Which one, the one in Deridu? Yes. The one that looks like a flea market? <laughs> My concern, it's a farmer's market, needs to work as a farmer's market. That whole place should be filled with people bringing in all their, all their uh, livestock and selling it. Because people need to go to one central point and then maybe even the hotels can do the same thing. That's maybe something you may want, you may, may be able to and hopefully be able to reach in there and find out how that can be improved. Because that is a designated farmer's market. Yes. But I, I don't see it working as such. My concern is that um, I met with an individual that I think is running the largest chicken farm now, Mr. Kenata. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand they're having some issues. Maybe you can assist them. I think it's dealing with GPA and GWA, and maybe helping them get the, uh, the, um, the assistance from those two autonomous agencies. Because you're the Department of Agriculture, and you, you, be, you should be able to leverage to assist them in getting the support they need. Because I hear this from most of the farmers out there. They're very concerned is that the water rates are high for them. And uh, from the Department of Agriculture standpoint, may, maybe you can provide us some information so we can change the law. We can. Okay. I know we were researching that um, last year with right. Senator Rigel, but we can provide you information on that. Okay, and if you can provide it, I think my colleagues will look forward to that because we want to help the farmers. If we're talking about this, like you mentioned, it tastes better when it's fresh, well, let's, let's support then the, the farmers out there. I mean, one farmer that I see a lot over at the National Guard, he told me, if you change the water rates, I can survive. Yeah. That's Mr. Wisting. And I can imagine everybody else saying that, change the water rates for us and then the price of their goods wouldn't keep going up. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to meet, meet their expense, and that's not fair to them, because they're the ones that's doing it. And then we can work on that. And then maybe you can also take a look at what property that's being held or was issued under Chamorro Land Trust. They're supposed to be farming. Yes. And if they're not farming, then maybe you need to report it. So that if they're not farming, then get it out to the people that are farming. There are some folks out there that have many, many acres. And I'm hearing from quite a few of their um, neighbors. Tens of acres, yeah. Tens, some of them 20. But I'm hearing from their neighbors, there's no farming going on. And I'm only concerned is that because you're the Department of Agriculture and you're dealing with farming <laughs> and we want to make sure that uh, there's conservation going on, there's no deers crossing into their property and getting shot or being held, that then you know, you guys can handle this, I know this. And you would have fun because I, I guess when you keep on applying for grants, they're gonna ask you these questions and then you'll be able to fulfill it. And with that, I know that there's one question that they forgot to ask you, drug tests. How are you doing for drug testing for your people? It's in your budget. I just wanted to know, uh, you know, you got, I think, $200 in your budget. 
Um, have you done any drug testing lately or hope to do some this year, well, upcoming year? We drug test every new hire. Okay, I mean, but and other then, than that, the random name. Yes, anytime there's been um, a concern that's, that has arisen, uh, <laughs> that's one of the considerations, absolutely. You haven't done any drug testing of your designated positions, which I assume even your conservation officers fall into place? There is an executive order, not by this administration, but there is one that mandates regular drug testing of designated positions in the government of Guam. Oh, no. So it would be something to look in because as okay. we know, we see we have a major, I mean, you know, as we discussed, the only thing that's going down that you can purchase on Guam are drugs. You know, from 800 to 150, that's a big drop. Yeah. You know, while gas and everything else is going up. So thank you. I, I had so many other questions about ag, but thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing that up. Because, I, I mean, we want to make sure our public officials that are representing our people and our paid bar, our people are not, you know, they're not, not involved in it and setting the example. And hopefully it will be a deterrent if they know they're going to be tested. Maybe they don't know what day, uh, you know, that they more than likely will not get involved in drugs because we do have a major drug problem on the island, so. That's great to know. Thank you. Yes, and also, Director, I, um, I understand they were mentioning overtime. There are folks that are exempt from overtime. I'm hoping they're going to the lowest level. And uh, if you needed additional support, send us a letter. And I'll provide copies to my colleagues so they understand what you're I mean, for an agency that is only asking for four million and is getting 20 million, we're gonna figure out a way how to help you. It's the only smart thing to do. Thank you're you. You're one, one of the very few agencies that bring in $20 million <laughs> federal grants. Wow, it's amazing. But with that, the committee, uh, the committee will conclude this budget hearing. Please provide us all the information that we can we'll do, sir. use to help you. And we'll continue to receive testimony. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on General Government Operation Appropriation and Housing and submit it via email to Senator Joe S. Anoxine at gmail.com or to my office located at Rand Care Building, second floor, suite 3, 761 Marine Corps Drive, Timonian, Guam. Sidzus Marci for your attendance today and participation in today's hearing. And for those at home, thank you for watching. The budget hearing on Bill 276 36 cr relative to the Department of Agriculture is duly heard and is now adjourned at 1042. Please have a nice and safe day. Take care.